is uh, one week before the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And we're going to pick up the story in Matthew 21, starting with verse 1. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey uh, tied there in a colt, which is a baby donkey, with her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, which happened to be Zechariah. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them. And brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them. And he sat on the coats. And most of the crowd spread their coats on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. And the crowds going ahead of him, and those who followed, were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when they had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred and said, who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple. And he overturned the tables and the money changes and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the highest, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes? You are prepared for yourself praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and they spent the night there. Now in the morning... When he was returning to the city, he became hungry, and seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves. And he said to it, No longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. Seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, What, or why, or how, did the fig tree wither all at once? Depends on what translation you have. How, why, what? Now, when we go back to chapter 21, verse 1, he told his disciples, go into the village opposite you, and you will find a donkey tied there in a colt, and tie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. Some would say, the Lord has need of them. The Lord has need of them. What you're going to find throughout this story is the focus was on the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the key that unlocked how to interpret and how to understand this whole chapter. If you don't get that, you won't get the chapter. And also you're going to find that this is connected to the God of the Old Testament and the Lordship that was shown there. Again, we'll get to that as we unpack this. And so here we see he tells them to say the Lord has need of it. So right there, he was implying he is the Lord over the donkey, the cult, and, of course, the Lord over this man's possessions. Uh, and so he was riding, actually, upon the cult, the baby donkey that was a the donkey that was never ridden upon. It was uh, still uh, not even fully weaned from the mother. So it was a, a donkey that was brand new. And this was to take place what was spoken through the prophet, and then it was a prophecy about how their king was going to come gentle and mounted on a donkey. So Jesus was fulfilling the scriptures of the prophets, the messianic scriptures, that is to say the scriptures that pointed to him being the Messiah. And uh, we see here that everything that was done was done according to the plan of God. Very, very amazing how Jesus is able to walk in these prophecies. He couldn't make it happen. It just happened because it was true. It was from God. It was prophesied in the past.
that the real Messiah was going to do this. And it's interesting how he didn't come riding on a horse. If he came riding on a horse, then he would have been coming as a warrior king to bring Israel back on, on, uh, on top of the, the, the empires of the world. And so he did not come to subsume the political empires of the world. He didn't come to bring Israel as the praise of the earth. He didn't come to make Israel the capital of the world at that time. If he was doing that, he would have came riding a horse. That's how kings would come in, uh, as the warrior king, as I say. So the fact that he came on a duck, he showed that he was coming as, as a humble king, and we found out later on, by implication, he had to die and humiliate himself, become of no reputation, so that he could save humanity before he could rule humanity. You hear what I'm saying? Now, he already was Lord and was the ruler of humanity, but what we're talking about is to not only rule us, but to save us so that we can co-reign, so that we can fellowship and be a part of that. And so he had to humble himself and allow himself to die in order for us to rule with him. He didn't have to die to be Lord. He had to die so we could be a part of his lordship. Do you understand that? To fellowship with him and co-reign with him, as it tells us in Romans 8. And so he came as a humble king. He came as a king uh, meant to die. He came as a king who did not want to bring political power right away. He came as a king who knew how to space his time. Do you know there's a timing for everything? There's a time to be in war, but there's a time to be in peace. There's a time to just let God do, do what he has to do when he gives you a prophetic word. And there's a time to, you know, hey, you got to do something else here to make something happen. And so Jesus understood the times and the seasons, even though the prophets didn't even understand what they were prophesying about. Half of the Jews or more thought that the Messiah was going to come as a conquering king right away. Some of them thought there was a prophet and a Messiah. Some thought there was a king, a Messiah, and a prophet. So it was very unclear. But as we read the scriptures, we find out that Jesus was not only the Messiah, but he came as the prophet that Deuteronomy 18 talks about Moses said, a prophet is going to rise like me. Whoever doesn't listen to his words will be cut off from amongst his people. That's verse 15. And so they were looking for maybe two or three. I don't know how many knew it was going to be one. It was very unclear. But here we see in this chapter and in this day that he was prophet, priest, king, Messiah, everything. Actually, throughout the week, we found that he was priest, he was the sacrificial lamb. He was everything. It was amazing. Uh, and so the disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them, brought the donkey, the colt, laid their coats on them. He sat on the coats. Now most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. Now, why was this done? This was not done uniquely for Jesus. It was a custom that when a conquering king came into a city, Many people would take their cloaks off, uh, basically your identity, who you are, that's what that represented, lay it down to show you're submitted to this king. Uh, same thing with the branches. And uh, the fact that they did this for Jesus, but he was not the Caesar. He was not even a political ruler in Israel. The fact that they did this, even though he held no earthly office, now think of it. They honored him as a king, even though he held no official office. What does that tell us? That tells us that God inspired them to do this, showing that his kingdom is not of this world. That his kingdom transcends every earthly kingdom. That his kingdom is not of the world, but it's over the world. That his kingdom doesn't depend on the rule of Rome, doesn't depend on the rule of the Caesar, doesn't depend on the rule of a Donald Trump or a governor or a mayor, doesn't even depend on whether you believe in him or not. That's right. His kingdom transcends every yes. kingdom, yes. every yes. village, every hamlet, every nook, every cranny. He is Lord of all. And so what this is telling us 
is that they were recognizing his lordship even though it did not comport with a political system or a worldly construct. In other words, he was lord even though it didn't fit what they were used to, the patterns they were used to. So he was the lord. He was the king, is the king, over a kingdom, now listen to this, that is over Rome, over Israel in those days, over the United States, over Russia, over China, over North Korea. His kingdom is over every kingdom. Yes. So this is not just about church on Sunday. It's not about just having a religious gathering and we worship God and God's involved in our life on Sunday, but he's insignificant on Monday. Uh, 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 uh. What this is telling us, by implication and by understanding the scriptures of the prophets, is that he is over every political system. Do you know how countercultural that act was to do that for somebody who didn't have a political office? I don't know. Are you catching this today? Yeah. So, um, and then it says, they shouted, Hosanna, that means save us or deliver us to the son of David. The fact that they called him the son of David alluded to Micah chapter 5 verse 2 where it says that the king was going to come out of Bethlehem, out of the offspring of David. There are other scriptures that show that. Uh, Hosanna, save us, uh, deliver us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, we see the word Lord, the name of the Lord. Wow. What does that mean? He came in the name of the Lord. Did that mean he came in the name of God the Father? Or did that mean he came in his own name? You see... If you look at Psalm 18, this is part of a pattern of praise that they would normally sing during this time of year. It's from Psalm 118. I forgot exactly the verses. Um, but this was done to show adoration towards God the Maker. I believe that he came in the name of the Lord, meaning he came representing himself. He was fulfilling the psalms that they sang every time of the year during that, that year. I, I, I can't remember exactly how it was pronounced in, in the uh, Hebrew, uh, but it's just a very powerful thing that shows us who Jesus was. So he came in the name of the Lord. He came in his own name. It's like I walk in this room, I come in the name of Joseph Matera. That's what that meant. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then it says, Hosanna, or save us, Hosanna in the highest, meaning we're praising the highest. We're not just praising a football team that just won the Super Bowl. We're not just praising somebody for great accomplishments. It says Hosanna in the highest, meaning there can be no higher praise that can be given, meaning there can be no higher attribute shown, Meaning there could be no higher God, yes. there could be no higher entity, That's no right. higher office, yes. no higher king, yes. no higher Lord. Yes. Meaning what they were doing was they were saying that Jesus is the greatest, Jesus is the most important, Jesus is the most uh, amazing person they had ever met or ever will meet. At that time they were saying, my praise goes to Jesus but not just praise. We praise a lot of people. But it's Hosanna in the highest. Meaning, I don't have any other God before him. I don't have any dreams of, uh, without him. I don't have anything that comes close to him. There's nothing in competition to him. It's Hosanna in the highest. Can someone say, Hosanna in the highest? And we say in the highest because he deserves the highest praise. It's because he is uh, uh, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. He is the most high God. Because in those days they believed in many gods. They were what's called a polytheistic, meaning many gods, polytheistic society. The Roman gods were millions. The Greek gods were millions. And during the Middle Eastern times they had many, many gods. Uh, but he was the highest. Again, pointing to Jesus. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred. 
How do you stir a city when you get a whole group of people proclaiming Hosanna in the highest? When people lift up Jesus as Lord, it's not just Jesus as healer. It's not just Jesus as one who loves me. It's not just Jesus as one who casts me. It's all of that. But the most powerful release of praise and power that Satan fears, that stirs a city. I mean, this is a heaven on earth. This is one place where God was giving us a foretaste of a heavenly Jerusalem, where a whole city was praising God. A whole city was laying down their identity. A whole city was yeah. laying down their life. Yeah. A whole city, except for a few religious elites uh, who objected to his uh, taking their territory, taking their praise, taking their money, taking their power, taking their prestige away. Yeah. Because if he was Lord, then what they stood for wasn't going to last. He was uh, undoing an old system and bringing in a new. So this is what happens when everybody in unison begins to say Hosanna in the highest. Pointing to him as Lord. You stir a city. I don't mean just having a worship service. There's some people that are just addicted to the presence of Jesus. Or they like the fact that Jesus makes them feel good when they come to church. I'm talking about you're laying your life down in that yeah, worship, right. and you're saying, it's not my will, it's your yes, will be done. It's right. not my life, it's your life. Yes. My life is Christ. I'm laying it all down. You are God. You are the highest. You're more important than the New York Giants, than the New York Yankees, uh, than my favorite soccer team, than all my money, all my possessions. You're more important than every ambition I have, yes. every goal in life. You're even more important than me. When we say Hosanna in the highest and mean it, if enough of us say that and live that, because you can't just mean that on Sunday, that means it's going to be spread out throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the year, throughout the life. When we live that way, we turn a city upside down. That's what this is talking about. So the whole city was stirred. Wow. Saying, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus. And then it, they identify him from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, this is amazing. The early church fathers had to wrestle with this. That's why we have creeds like the Creed of uh, Nicaea, Council of Nicaea, and, and, and the Nicene Creed and things like this. How in the world can we say Hosanna in the highest to somebody from Nazareth? I'm just trying to bring out all the, the, the colors of this text, the depth. Try to get you to understand the meaning of, of some of these incredible statements. It would be like saying if Jesus was here today, if he didn't come 2,000 years ago, but he came today. It would be like saying, Jesus, the Most High, from Sunset Park. In other words, you hung out with him. He was a local carpenter. He might have even made your doghouse or your chicken coop or your bookcase. And he hung out, man. He's just like one of them. We knew his earthly father. Of course, it wasn't his real father. He was really his stepfather. We knew his mother. And, you know, he's just one of the boys, you know, hanging out. But, you know, wait a minute. In the highest? Now that I think about it, I never heard him say any negative thing. I never heard him cuss. I never saw him slander anybody. I never saw him bully anybody. I saw him going out of his way all the time to help. I saw him as a servant. Matter of fact, I never saw any blemish on him. My God, this, this boy that I grew up with is the Messiah. That is one of the most amazing Things to try to figure out how could God be a man and walk among us and still save us and live a sinless life. Isn't that amazing? When you see those words, Jesus from Nazareth, that's loaded. That speaks of the deep mystery of how God wanted to communicate with us. And he loved us so much. 
And he wanted to fellowship with us so much that he had to bridge the gap between us and him by becoming a man. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the one that represents God to the exact detail. He is the exact representation of his being, it says in Hebrews chapter 1. And so God so loved the world, God so loved you and me, that he wanted you to be able to at least wrap your brain around him a little bit. He wanted you to at least have some way of connecting with him even a little bit. He wanted to at least show how much emotion he had towards you, how much he loved you, how much he cared by walking among us, by being hungry and thirsty and submitting himself, taking himself of no rep reputation, emptied himself of his power. So that he could be with us. That's why it was so amazing. Jesus of Nazareth. He's the one the prophets spoke about. He's the one who created all things. He's the one who made all things. He's the one whom all the prophets spoke about. And whom the whole world is being consumed in him throughout history. History is his story. This carpenter who made my bookshelf is the one in whom all of history is about. Oh, I don't know if you're catching this. There are thousands of theological books and writings trying to figure that one out. I am not going to attempt to do it. Then it says, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables and the money changes and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a, a robber's den. Now look at this one. The temple. Whose temple is this? The temple of? Of God. Right? So this is the fulfillment of what you know, Moses uh, built a tabernacle, a tent in the wilderness, and then uh, Solomon built a temple. It was destroyed, then it was rebuilt by Herod, but it was God's temple where they had offerings and sacrifices, and in the most holy place, God dwelt. It was God's temple. What did Jesus call it? He said my house isn't that amazing wow another translation uh, also says my father's house but as it says in John 5 if he called God his father he made himself equal with God because if God is your father and you're of the same essence that means you're eternal like God very deep stuff so he said, my father's house, or my house shall be called a house of prayer. You're making a robber's den. And why was that? It's because they were buying and selling in the temple. And basically what was going on started off okay. If you come from a long distance and you want to offer an animal sacrifice for Passover, you're not going to be traveling 3,000 miles with a goat. I mean, you could try it. You know, we don't have airplanes in those days, obviously, your cars and all these storage trains. So you would have to carry that thing somehow. So to spare them, they would buy the animal in the temple area for money. So what was Jesus upset at? He wasn't upset at that. That makes plenty of sense. He was upset because this transaction became a system of merchandising which then turned into commercialization and it was taken from outside the temple to inside the temple courts by essence what was happening they were changing it from a sacred place to an opportunist place a place of opportunity to make money off of people's love of god whenever we try to commercialize the gospel, commercialize the church, 
whenever we take advantage of people's hunger for God and use their hunger as a way to extract money from them for our own personal gain, it gets God angry. And there's a lot that can be said about that, but I want to stay on point here. So they were commercializing his house. And what did he do? Well, he <coughs> overturned the tables of the money changers. Now, I imagine those tables were very heavy. Jesus was in shape. <laughs> Jesus was a carpenter. He wasn't a 99-pound weakly walking around not knowing and insecure, not knowing what he was doing, who he was. I mean, this guy was a carpenter. But I don't know how many years, maybe 25 years or 20 years, whatever it was. And he would overturn tables. And then in John, it says that he took out a scourge of cords. If you want to say what it is, it's a whip. He took out a whip and he started whipping people's behinds. <laughs> God gets angry when we take advantage of people for our own ill-gotten gain. Because then what happens is people get discouraged, disillusioned. They think it's all a game. It's all a gimmick. They blame God. They leave the church. And they don't want anything to do with God. And we've seen that happen. So Jesus, he's a man's man. He just took care of business. He lifted a table, probably take 10 men to lift. He lifted it himself. And he dealt with that issue. But then it says, and the blind and the lame came to him. Wow. How was it that he was able to put on such a demonstration of power and a strength and courage in the face of a political and religious system that was corrupt, outnumbered? He was there amongst hundreds that were involved in this. This one wasn't two or three. This is hundreds of people that were selling. How was it he was able to do that, stand up to them, Show dominance. And then the blind and the lame flocked to him. Now, in many Hebrew Jewish traditions, it was taught that the blind and the lame were not allowed in the temple. They had to stay in the outer courts. If that's the case, when Jesus was there, they felt comfortable. No matter what right. your challenges are. Yes. As strong as he is against those religious leaders. And he was strong. Why? Because they were hindering people like you and me from believing in God. Yes. He, as you look at the Gospels, he was the strongest against the religious hypocrites. Because he said, you shut the kingdom of heaven from men. You stop people from going to heaven who are trying to enter. When it came to even the prostitutes and, and the corrupt lawyers and the tax collectors and the people that would despise the society, it says that he ate and drank with them. Powerful. He's not against sinners. He's against those who stop sinners from seeking Jesus. And so, in spite of putting on such a show of power and force, he did it in a way where he didn't lose his temper. He was managed somehow. He was able to do it in, in some kind of gentleness and humility in a way that even the blind and the lame would come to him. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. If you're sick today, he wants to heal you. If you're hurting, he wants to heal you. If you don't know Jesus, he wants to know you. He'll never turn you away, no matter what your past, no matter how messed up you've been in the past, no matter how messed up your family life is, no matter what's going on, you need to understand that there is a safe place. Someone say, there is a safe place, a safe place. In, Jesus. in Jesus. So when the scribes and the Pharisees saw the wonderful things he did, you would think they would say, praise God! The blind are getting healed. The lame are getting to walk and all that. No, no, no. They were upset. People don't care how much success you have if it pinches upon their own influence and their own territory. And so they were upset. And they said to him, do you hear what these people are saying, what these children are saying? When they said, glory to God, Hosanna to the son of David. And Jesus said, out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, I prepared praise for myself. 
One of the greatest truths that Jesus is Lord is that you could have one and two year old children filled with the Holy Ghost, praising God, knowing God. You could have the uneducated. You could have people that are challenged, if you know what I mean, in many ways. You could have people that are very simple, and yet Jesus can be Lord in their life. It's not just for the educated. It's not just for the religious. It's not just for the elite. It's not just for people who will go through some kind of process of initiation and illumination like the Gnostics taught. It is for every, to such an extent that even... John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb when he heard the sound of Mary because it had to do with Jesus. Everybody can be saved and know Jesus, no matter what their mental abilities. And that's what he was saying here. Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have ordained praise. That's deep. Try to preach on that. Nursing babies, not even toddlers, can praise God. Whew. I mean, I, I've got a sense of that with my own kids. Uh, those who, you know, been walking with God from the beginning, they don't even know when they were saved. They don't have a testimony. Well, I got saved when I was 10. Now, two of my kids, I won't mention who they are, uh, but uh, did have that experience. But three of them, they just always felt like they knew God. And that's very common. You know, at some point they just gave their life to Christ. But to them, it was just second knowledge. They just did it. Uh, and so, uh, in another part of this, in the Luke narrative, Luke 19, Jesus told them, if these remain silent, the very stones will cry out. And he left them, he went out to, this, uh, to Bethany, and then when he came back, that's when he cursed the fig tree, and the fig tree dried up. Now, why am I bringing all of this out? Because if you examine this, it correlates, believe it or not, probably really going to blow your mind. All of this correlates with Genesis chapter 1. You say, how in the world does this correlate with Genesis chapter 1? Genesis chapter 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It tells us in John 1, 3, that apart from him was nothing made that has been made. When you see all the entities that were worshiping him on Palm Sunday, you will see the stones. They represent what? The earth that was made. The earth. It says in the Psalms, the trees in the field clap their hands. Then you see uh, the fig tree dried up. That represents the plant kingdom. It's under his lordship. And then you see, uh, when he took the dog, he said, the Lord has need of it. That represented the animal kingdom. And then he made man on the sixth day, and all those people worshiping him represented humanity. What he was saying here, and this chapter was showing, is that he's Lord of all. He's not just Lord on Sunday. If you're into botany, you go to the botanical gardens, you see the glory of God. If you're into astronomy, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. If you're into uh, music, well, he is the one that after he created the heavens, it says in the book of Job, the stars rejoiced. They celebrated. My God, you can't get away from his creation no matter what you're called to do, no matter what your gifts and abilities, no matter who you are, you're supposed to submit your talents, your gifts, your finances, your life, your ambitions. What this is telling us on Palm Sunday is he is Lord of all, not just a two-hour Sunday service. And not to get too much, but in the next two, three minutes, I love to connect the First and Second Testament. This goes back to what's called the Shema, the most important passage to the Jews. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to show you the connection between what happened here. If you know a Jewish person, They'll understand what I'm saying. This is their most important passage. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. God is mentioned in three forms, but it says he's one. Shows the triune God, the Trinity right there. And then it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. 
So what is our response to the Lordship of Christ as shown on Palm Sunday? The response is here. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and talk of them when you sit in your house. In other words, the Lordship of Christ has to first and foremost start in your house. You can't depend on the church to teach your children or to help your, your kids on Fridays. We want to help. But at the end of the day, if Jesus is Lord, the Lordship of Christ is going to be manifest in your house. What you watch on television, what you celebrate, what you talk about should be a reflection of who Jesus is. We should teach our children. We should bring the word of God out to them. We should have Bible study. We should pray. But not just that. The culture of our house should represent the fact that we are under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So we should diligently teach our children. The other thing it says here is that when we walk by the way and when we lie down and when we rise, we're supposed to bring the Lordship of Christ and talk about that. When we walk by the way, that means as we're just doing life. Tomorrow when you get on that subway, Stop complaining. Jesus is Lord over the MTA. Jesus is Lord over the bus. Jesus is Lord over Goldman Sachs. Jesus is Lord over Wall Street. Jesus is Lord over the military, over uh, the public educational system. He's Lord over the sanitation department. He's Lord over the mayor, over the governor. In other words, uh, when we walk by the way, we don't separate Jesus from our daily life. It has to do with just living your life. If Jesus is only Lord on Sunday, or if he is only Lord in the church, then quite frankly, he's not Lord at all. And then he says, you shall bind them as a sign in your hand, the frontlets on your forehead, you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. I'm going to skip, and what is the warning out of this? Verse 13, you shall fear only the Lord your God. You shall respect him, worship him, and swear by his name. You shall not follow any other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who surround you. For the Lord your God in the midst of you is a jealous God, and uh, he basically wants to be the only Lord. And so what is the application? We follow him in our house. We follow him outside in our vocations. Or we just go about our business. He's a Lord over the New York Yankees and New York Giants. He's a Lord over everything. But we also understand that we're not to follow the gods of the world. And one of the main competing things of the Lordship of Christ is the gods of this world. What is the God of America? He said, don't follow. Don't put the gods of the peoples around you before me. In other words, there are competing gods. I believe the God of the U.S. is consumerism. Yes. Materialism. Living for pleasure. The love of money. Sex is glorified. It's almost like sex has become a, a, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, God. It's become so big and rampant in our culture that it's now detached from romance and emotion. That's why you have apps like Tinder. They just want to hook up and go on their way. Jesus is already Lord. But he wants to be Lord over your life today. And he will not tolerate other gods that compete with him. If he's not Lord over everything, he's not Lord at all. I want us to pray. They had many gods. In those days, there were millions of Roman gods, millions of Greek gods. They had the god of war, the god of sex, the fertility, the god of everything, money. 
Before you walked in a forest, you had to almost offer a sacrifice to the god of the forest. And they were gods in trees called, I think, dryads. They were gods in rivers. That was so countercultural when God told them, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And then it said, Don't have any gods before me. That means you didn't have to worship all these territorial gods, the gods of the hills, the gods of money, the gods of sex, the gods of rivers. No, no, there's only one God. Applying it to us today, it should be only one God. Someone say one God. one God. That means not just theologically in our mind we know there's one God, but that means in our heart, our response is yes. Yes. we only have one God that we serve and worship. I want us to pray. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings. One of the ways we reflect who is God, who's the boss is in our giving and what we give. And we really believe in this gospel of Jesus Christ, what this day represents. We want to support it so we can see more and more people come to know Christ and celebrate Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. That God, we can honor you with our giving, as it says in Proverbs 3. We can honor you, God, with that tent and beyond. Father, it's just a small thing we could do to show our love, show our worship, and we could give you that tent, and we could see Jesus be exalted across the nations. Thank you, God, for this church, for this congregation, for this family of families, and their generosity their love for you, and their love for all the people in their communities and their families. Help us, oh God, to see your Lordship manifest in our homes with our children and our children's children. We'll have a generational blessing that will become a generational dynasty that will become a family that will have such influence that will outlast anything we could ever imagine way beyond our lifetime. Thank you that as we give, we are giving to a multi-generational church. And Lord, as you told me not long ago, even though we're 34 years old, we're still in our baby stages. The best is yet to come. We're going to be here until you come back bodily a second time. And so we're investing in the future and our children's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and beyond. And those that are not yet in this church. Jesus' name. You can give on the church app, Res of New York. Uh, God bless you, you're giving. I've already given on the app.